Hi everyone, um, welcome all. Um, we are starting on time, uh, also to avoid uh, that we run over too much. We have a lot to share with you today. Um, great that you're joining this webinar uh, on building circular design uh, or uh, designing and building circular supply chains. Um, before we start, uh, of course, a couple of administrative things. Um, the webinar will be recorded, so uh, in case you need to drop out, um, you are able to uh, to review it afterwards. Um, the first um, part of this webinar is a presentation and the second part. So we hope to have around 15 minutes to uh, get into a discussion and conversation with you. Um, uh, and, and answer any questions that you might have. Um, you can ask your questions in the uh, Q&A functionality uh, on the top right of the, uh, the interface. Uh, we will, of course, try to ask, uh, answer as many questions uh, as we can, but we know from experience that we won't be able to cover them all. Um, so we intend to, to, to at least try to follow up with some of you to, uh, to address these questions. Um, yeah, I think uh, let's let's start and have a look at the uh, at the agenda um, for today. And before doing that, um, you know, just a quick note on who we are. Um, my name is Thijs Martens. I work as a sustainability competence lead in Philips Engineering Solutions. Um, yeah, we we are here to really um, you know help our businesses internally and externally to uh, to implement sustainability. And I'm today I'm joined uh, by my colleague Hans. Uh, Hans, can you uh, just uh, share a few words on what you do and who you are? Yes, of course. Uh, glad to be here and uh, my name is Hans Leijen. I am a senior supply chain consultant in Philips Engineering Solutions and you will hear today that uh, supply chain is really my passion. Thank you Hans. Um, so let's go over the agenda a little bit uh, more. Uh, first uh, I want to provide a little bit more context about who we are, uh, where we come from, uh, what drives us. Then of course the context around the circular economy. Uh, what are we talking about here and why is it important? And then I will hand over to my colleague Hans, who knows everything about uh, circular supply chains. Chains. Uh, we will talking. We will be talking about the general overview uh, around supply chain as a as a as a foundational building block of a circular economy. And then looking into the learnings of what we've done, been doing, and a methodology that we apply within Philips. And of course, then we will go into a Q and A. So uh, when we move on. Um, and look into who we are. Uh, as I mentioned, we are Philips Engineering Solutions. Um, we are an inter uh, integral part of the uh, Innovation and Strategy Department in Philips, and we're positioned to serve internal as well as external customers with their um, yeah, wishes to bring sustainability to life. It's not the only thing that we do that you can see in the nice wheel on the, on the bottom right of your screen. Uh, but today we will be focusing on the sustainability implementation capability within uh, our organization and even deeper on the sub competence area of uh, circular supplies and supply chain management. Um, yeah, so 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 moving on uh, when we when we go into why we have this webinar, um, I think the most important thing I want to share today about this slide is that I feel conflicted about sharing it because I think we're past uh, the question uh, of why. Um, of course, you know, uh, we cannot step over the urgency that we see and feel even in our day-to-day -day lives when it comes to transitioning to a circular economy, a more purposeful economy, a more sustainable economy. And, and especially, of course, um, today we feel uh, that uh, the overconsumption of resources we are uh, yeah, confronted with, with, a, with a, on, on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and, and we feel that not just in the way we do business, but also in our personal lives. Um, but let's 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 assume and also bring back to your personal uh, uh, jobs uh, that uh, we can skip over the why because we are all aware of what's going on and that's uh, uh, yeah I'm, I'm very happy with that. Um, if we then go into sort of the how, um, we know that uh, transitioning to a circular economy is one of the solutions to work to work towards a more sustainable, uh, inclusive society. Um, in which we um, you know, have the intention to decouple economic growth um, from resource use and, and generic uh, prosperity. Um, when we look at the right part of this screen, um, of course, the circular economy is uh, built up out of multiple strategies. And this, this, this butterfly diagram might be familiar with you. Um, the strategies that you see on the right um, 
um, you know, they depict that we really need to rethink the way we build our businesses, uh, the way we interact with each other, uh, our customers, etc. Um, and that we see sort of, a, you know, to be able to bring these strategies that you see on the right to life, we, we really need to, you know, be aware that uh, we will see changing rules, roles, responsibilities, but also the results of how we do business. And I think towards the latter, you know, within Philips, we are driving proactively a strategy to become more circular because we believe that the results of a circular economy will be beneficial for us as a company, but also to wider society. And um, finally, what I want to say about this slide is that when we look at the strategies of a circular economy, so as a service, refurbishment, parts recovery, but also recycling, supply chain management is a foundational building block of uh, generating a, a, a sustainable uh, or a circular economy. Um, and yeah, when we start to talk about supply chains, um, um, I'm not the right person to go into that. Um, so I would also like to, to invite my colleague uh, Hans to bring you along and share his passion around uh, circular supply chains and, and dive a little bit deeper on the on the why, how and what of circular supply chains uh, uh, within Philips. So Hans, uh, on to you. Yeah, thank you, Thais. Uh, thank you for this uh, this introduction. And I'm very happy to, to be able to share our experiences in the domain of uh, circular supply chain. And looking also from the supply chain perspective, even uh, um, the circularity has become more relevant than ever. Uh, think about the supply chain disruptions and material shortages that we've seen over the past years. It's really a signal. Uh, and also there we see that uh, circularity of materials uh, becomes a really important means to mitigate the shortages moving forward. Uh, that is the lesson learned from the recent years. Uh, so besides the sustainability impact, I think also for supply chains, it's really important to pick this topic up. And when we look at our traditional supply chain, which I also grew up in, is that we have developed our supply chains basically uh, along uh, the dark blue line in the, the, uh, the right hand side of, uh, side of the slide. Uh, we manufacture from new supply, deliver that to customers uh, and uh, we service that. And when we then look into the uh, circular loops that you see in this diagram, uh, you could say that in our regular supply chains as we have today, the two inner circles we can accommodate. Uh, 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 when we use less, uh, basically that's something that we can accommodate uh, in our supply chains, only we have to move less goods or we have to deliver more software. When we look into service, uh, generally that's done, uh, but in circularity, the service element will increase and also upgrades will increase. But when we look at the three outer circles of this diagram, then we see that things become very different because there we see that we have to actually take back products from our customers, from our installed base, and we have to find other purposes in terms of refurbishes, refurbishment, past recovery, or recycling. So we have to take back and bring back into our supply chains, which also means new roles in supply chain, and that's what I will be covering today. So, before going into the circular supply chain, uh, let's take one step back uh, because uh, circular supply chain is not in itself. Uh, we believe that in order to deliver circular value for customers, company, and of course, planet, uh, we, uh, we need three pillars. Circular product design, uh, products that enable circularity, circular business models uh, that enable taking back products from our customers and also repurposing used products and parts to our customers and circular supply chain to make the flow of materials happen. And that is three important pillars, but also these three important pillars cannot go, cannot fly within our companies uh, without a strong foundation. Uh, and the strong foundation is really having as a company a circular vision, strategy and real commitment from leadership. And that is where I would like to bring an example in the, um, uh, as, uh, as the um, leadership commitment in Philips. Uh, because uh, here in this slide, uh, you see a summary of the Philips uh, ambition and objectives for 2025. Uh, whereby Philips 
has, is committed to take 25% of its sales from circular products, services, and solutions, whereby we avoid landfill from our manufacturing sites, where we design all our new products against eco design requirements. And in the scope of our uh, presentation today, uh, disclosing the loop, uh, because that is really about circularity. Uh, we offer the trade in from all, for all our professional medical equipment from our customers, and we will take care of responsible repurposing of what we take back. Uh, and that is a challenge, of course, to make that uh, uh, circularity happen. And so the commitment within Philips uh, we have as an example here, and also uh, in the in the next slide, uh, I would like to uh, to go into one of the other pillars, uh, because this circular product design is so much related uh, to the impact that we can have, and also related to the way we have to set up our circular supply chain. Uh, if the products are designed for linear use it's far more difficult uh, to disassemble, to extract materials, to reuse materials. And so it is really connected. And on this topic, we held a webinar last year, October. And uh, if, you're interested, uh, if you're interested, I can really recommend to review that uh, webinar. Uh, it is available on our website and the link to that, uh, uh, to that uh, recording will be posted in the chat of this uh, uh, webinar today. But after this, let me then now really go to my favorite uh, topic, which is circular supply chain. And uh, we will now look into uh, the, the impact of, uh, uh, of circular economy on the uh, way we conduct our uh, supply chains. And for that, I would like to first go into a definition. Uh, because in our normal linear economy, uh, we have set up our supply chains in a linear way, uh, whereby uh, we actually uh, uh, make our uh, products uh, uh, with uh, parts and materials uh, which are newly sourced uh, and we deliver those to uh, our customers and uh, 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 make sure that they are serviced in the, uh, uh, during the lifetime. And that's what we call uh, our linear supply chain. If you can depict that on the, on the screen, please. Yeah. Uh, so that's a linear supply chain as we all used to that in our linear economy. So, uh, but as mentioned also in the butterfly diagram, uh, we saw that now we have to bring in those take back looks. And that means that we need to add a uh, reverse supply chain to enable the take back from our customers. To be able to deinstall and collect devices and, and products from our customers reprocess them and make them available for a reuse, a second life proposition, eh, whether as a product, a part or as a material. And so basically we are adding the reverse supply chain to our linear supply chain. And within that combination, eh, I would like to uh, define as a circular supply chain and also look at it from that perspective, eh, because linear supply chain and reverse supply chain will always impact each other and will be interrelated. <coughs> Sorry. So when we now look into um, uh, Philips uh, where, uh, and the Philips experience that uh, that we see is that uh, actually uh, when looking into circularity and circular supply chain, we have already quite some experience in the domain of large medical e medical equipment uh, as a big MR scanners, etc. Whereby uh, you see that uh, that uh, uh, equipment, uh, it is uh, it's capital equipment, uh, is high value, and uh, and also what you see is that the value of the equipment and the high value uh, uh, components and parts in that equipment remain to have a, uh, have a very long lifetime, uh, and also remain having a, a value. And uh, we have shown in uh, in this area of our business uh, that uh, refurbishment of devices and offering refurbished devices to the market and uh, uh, recovery of the uh, of the expensive parts uh, is really bringing business value and also value to our customers. But the real challenge comes up uh, when we look into the commitment uh, that we also have to add the smaller medical devices. 
And think, for instance, about patient monitors uh, that you see in the hospitals. Then you see that the quantities that we have in our installed base will be significant higher. Uh, and then uh, uh, instead of the uh, lower quantities that we see in the uh, uh, large medical, uh, you see uh, much higher quantities that we, uh, that we can expect back. And also the value of the parts, components and the device themselves is much lower. And think about that even further when you, and there's also, you see the, the drivers coming up more and more in the society that also for consumer goods, such as shavers, such as toothbrushes, and also there we have to move towards that circularity. And then also we are, will be confronted with uh, even lower values of the, the, of the products uh, and even higher uh, volumes in terms of quantities. Uh, so really the challenge that we are facing is how can we manage the higher return volumes uh, which come from global customer base and in terms of cost of that uh, 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 the repurposing and the take back and the repurposing operations that we remain competitive against the new buy alternatives because uh, as mentioned for these small medical devices and consumer goods the parts and components are relatively cheap eh? so you must be very cost effective and that was the challenge in uh, in also our project is the projects that we have conducted and today i would like to uh, to bring in some insights that especially we got in working with our hospital patient monitor business business uh, whereby uh, we are working on the program uh, to work towards the 2025 commitment and being able uh, to have that circularity in place there and um, and as we started off uh, in this in this program, uh, we uh, chose for learning by doing uh, because it is an unknown terrain. Uh, uh, you think that you can do it, uh, but uh, we found out that it is important to learn by do and do pilot projects. And here in the left hand side of the uh, uh, slide, uh, I have a case study, one of the pilots that we did uh, done. Uh, whereby uh, we had a, uh, a, a shortage coming up for spare parts for one of our monitors in the field. Uh, it is a main board and um, uh, one of the components of the main board is not available on the market anymore. Um, and thus uh, we uh, were asked, okay, can you look into parts recovery from trade-in devices so that we can secure the availability of those main boards as spare parts? And that provided great learning. And the good news is that we managed to do that eh, and we managed to avoid shortages in here and brought in quite some business value. But also, and that is the big benefit by doing this, is that we also get learnings about the challenges eh, for, ch for scaling towards 2025, eh, because then we can expect big volume. And what we noticed is that the process to get this done was quite manual, quite cumbersome on multiple domains. And those are depicted in those circles that you see here. And I would like to uh, look into those in the clockwise, uh, starting with quality and compliance. Uh, think about it. We are reusing used materials. And in the Philips case, in a medical uh, application, which means that we have to make sh fully sure that whenever we reuse, that we uh, comply with all quality and, uh, and regulatory requirements. And in this pilot case, we were very lucky because this spare part was designed as a repairable spare part. And so there we were good to go. Uh, but for other parts that have not been defined as such, uh, you have a challenge. Which brings me then also to the product design. Uh, so uh, you have to have designed your parts and your products that they can be refurbished or can be reused as parts. And also what we found in this pilot, for instance, is that also during the lifetime, hey, you see quite some, for instance, engineering changes. And so this main board in this example uh, had, has had many uh, version changes over time, which then also it brings in a challenge because if you take back devices, you get various versions of main boards and that affects your yield and your processing that you have to do. And then we have the process and systems our IT systems, our ERP systems, SAP, etc., are set up in a linear way. And I can, I, I can tell you, it, it is quite a burden 
had to book back used materials or used products into stock and make those products move around the world uh, because many of the systems are not just not set up for that uh, and uh, especially also topics like uh, the financial uh, uh, value, uh, valuation for instance of used parts uh, that's something that 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 is essential to have that available and even if you have the process and systems available then we come to the topic of ownership uh, like for buying we have Plenty of buyers buying new materials from suppliers for manufacturing. But for the buying of trade in devices uh, or uh, recovered parts uh, uh, for reuse and to make those move across the world, that's not a piece of cake. And the new fast uh, buyers are not the obvious team to do that for you. Uh, so we have to assign who will do what. And then sustainability impact, eh? because that's what we do it for. In the end, we want to have this circularity as eh, contributing to sustainability. And then when you look at the picture on the left, we are actually only taking one part from a device. What about the rest of the parts? Eh? So it means that we did a, a nice job here, but eh, the point is that also we have to have a purpose for all of the other parts in the device. And then last but not least, the financial impact. In this case, we had a very good business case because we avoided a shortage, eh, which is a great cost avoidance. But when the uh, circuit board here on the right would be uh, available, would have been available as new buy, we would, in terms of cost, have a very big challenge to compete against the new buy prices eh, because eh, that board is pretty cheap. Eh, so there also we have that challenge to compete against new buyers. So from that perspective, we learned that in order to be scaling to 2025, to move to tens of thousands of devices per year, uh, per year uh, we have to work on all of these uh, circles uh, that you see in this picture. And that's where we learned also like, OK, hey, guys, we have to uh, now uh, move to a structural design of our circular supply chain uh, to make sure that we can enable all the processes and the organization that we need uh, for the scaling. And that's where we also then move to the next slides, uh, which is about a circular supply chain design, where I would like to uh, spend a few minutes now on how we approach that in, in the programs uh, that we are currently conducting. Uh, so basically, so, so, uh, circular supply chain design in the basics is similar to a regular supply chain design. Um, hey, we start off from the vision and strategy, hey, and then we uh, need to design the supply chain elements. Hey, and this is basically also a new kind of supply chain that we're setting up. So we have to uh, uh, set up a supply chain network and processes. We have to uh, embed the planning and control. We have to organize. We have to make sure that we have the system and tools in place and the KPIs to monitor our progress and success. And once we have created the architecture, how the circular supply chain should look like, uh, we can then move forward to the deployment and the scaling. And before going into those elements in the uh, supply chain design, uh, also important to mention uh, that it is important to take uh, uh, four steps in the approach. Uh, starting off from the scope and the requirements, uh, which are driven from the vision and strategy and have those scope and requirements also aligned with leadership. Then identify the options that we have. Eh? Think about, should we go local, global, in-source, outsource, and that kind of options that we all have all available. And based on that uh, uh, options and the requirements that we have set up, eh, we can then make a selection how the future supply chain should look like, bearing in mind the quantities that we foresee 2025 and onwards. Uh, and when, once that is done, uh, we can then further detail the supply chain design. Now, basically similar to what you do in a supply chain design for regular uh, uh, linear supply chain, uh, but I would like in the design elements to emphasize some specifics uh, that we have learned in circularity that you have to take into account. Uh, so let's first look into the uh, network and the processes on the next slide. Um, uh, whereby uh, basically 
it is good to understand that the nature of your reverse supply chain and the setup of your reverse supply chain looks completely different from what we are used to in, uh, in linear supply chain. Because actually, your goods movements start from the customer. Huh? So basically, uh, uh, as the first step that we have in here, we have the customers and we have the, our global markets. Uh, 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 if you have a global delivery, uh, it is a global process. Uh, so the markets and the customers uh, um, align on trade-in deals, very much dependent also on the life cycle status of your product, uh, when you take back uh, and how you take back. And once uh, you get with the customer that alignment of take back, then we have to also set up a collection. Uh, it can also be included at the installation, you have to make sure that products will be packaged and that we can collect them. And after collection, then we have to also bring those products together and we have to think about, OK, how do we store those? Because they come from a global perspective. Eh? Do we make an inventory of the return products? Eh? Uh, where will we uh, take that inventory? And very important, like what will we do with the products? Because products, depending on the life cycle, and on the technical state, uh, it can be quite different. So we have to do a triage. Uh, and preferably, if there is a demand for refurbished devices, we would like to go into re refurbishment because that's adding the biggest value. And uh, so then you go into refurbished operations, uh, whereby refurbished devices uh, and uh, uh, and uh, enable offering these uh, uh, as new as uh, um, refurbished products to your customers. Uh, whereby you then in your portfolio have new supply products and also refurbished products. The second option that we have is the past recovery. Uh, so we can recover parts from the devices that have a value and can have a value to use those parts in the refurbishment process. But also we can recover parts to be used as spare parts or even as production materials. Uh, and there you see that the, those recovered parts uh, kind of can compete uh, against new supply parts uh, uh, or uh, repairs that come back from the field. And then the third flow is the uh, recycling, uh, because uh, in the end there will uh, be parts, uh, uh, devices that can not be repurposed in refurbishment or recovery, and you need to recycle them in a in a good way and pre preferably bring those products, uh, bring those materials back to the production sites or to our suppliers or make them available for other applications whereby uh, we rather maintain the value uh, than the downcycling. Uh, so uh, it is also there about uh, uh, keeping the value of the materials uh, in a circular way. Uh, so basically that is where you see that in, in, in the structure already that is different from linear supply chains. And on the next slide, uh, I've uh, uh, mentioned some differences between linear supply chain and reverse supply chain. Uh, so linear is really coming from all kinds of sources uh, of materials from multiple suppliers converging towards the product, whereby as in the reverse supply chain, we this, the product that returns is our starting point. And basically we are diverging that to refurbished uh, products, recovered parts, and uh, 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 recycled materials. Then also in the linear supply chain, uh, we can pull uh, and based on a uh, uh, new supply of uh, materials and parts being unlimited available. Whereas in circular, uh, we have to take back. Uh, and depending on the life cycle of the product, there will be a volume of products coming back. And that means that the planning of your circular activities and offering will be uh, based on what you get back. And there's limited trade in supply, and you have to make sure that you address that. In linear, we have distribution, whereas in reverse, we have to collect products. In linear, we buy parts from our suppliers and we assemble them, etc. In reverse, actually, your operations are more service operations like disassembly, like taking out parts, like testing parts. In linear, you have production and assembly in terms of operations. In reverse, you have refurbishment, parts recovery, recycling, having different nature. And in linear, we can trade new products globally. And in uh, reverse, uh, you are trading used products uh, and parts, 
which uh, in cross, especially in cross-border trade, uh, can have quite some restrictions and, uh, uh, and complications. And so that's about the networking process. So quite some differences. And let me also on the other uh, elements, uh, uh, given some of the differences without going too much into to details, uh, but really good to look into that. Uh, so when we look into the circular processes like refurbishment, past recovery and recycling, uh, we have to look into the capabilities uh, because I can assure you that these capabilities needed are in terminology similar to what we do in new manufacturing, uh, but in, re in capabilities needed, uh, they're quite different. Uh, and all of the, uh, the topics mentioned here need your attention uh, and you will find out that there's different capabilities needed. And also for the planning on the next slide, there you see that uh, basically the planning structures uh, for the supply chain people in this uh, in this webinar, uh, it will be familiar that we have planning processes going from the long term uh, towards the execution. But the uh, the interesting part when we go into the planning processes in circularity is this supply element, uh, because in our linear supply chain uh, we can go from this more or less unlimited supply from new materials. Whereas here we have to align uh, with the availability uh, that com will come back from the market. Uh, so if we want to promise, for instance, to our spare parts uh, departments, how many parts they can get, uh, we have to make sure that we will have sufficient trade-ins uh, to cover for that demand. Uh, and that's then also other kind of discussion because also the trade-ins uh, will be uh, um, input from your uh, markets and your businesses. Uh, so planning in terms of high level process will remain the same, but the execution and the focus will be completely different. And also the organization, the next slide, that's a bit, a bit of my favorite even, and I will keep short. But the basic question that you see there is the question whether, whether you want to integrate the reverse activities in the existing linear supply chain or organize the reverse functions with focus on circular business and operations uh, because you see that the combination is very often difficult uh, and focus may help and depending on the organization setup and size uh, you may have to make different choices there uh, organization is a key element and ownership as mentioned uh, is one of those uh, uh, critical uh, things that we have to develop. And then also system and tools. Let me also there take uh, take three elements and also there um, let's make sure that we use uh, the era that we are in and that we can be data driven. Uh, we have the tools now, we have data uh, that we can uh, support uh, our decision making processes. And first of all, we already see that in design. Uh, we start from basically from scratch. We need to gear up very quickly and so it's important that we have scenario based supply chain and financial models uh, so that we can make the good design decisions uh, and we, we develop and apply these in our projects. The second is that we have uh, that we need the systems and IT structures to be set up uh, to support our decision making uh, and our operations in the processes. Some examples given here. And the third element is of course that we can monitor our progress and success because it is new uh, and it is important that we can uh, that we have the dashboards in place that we can monitor the result monitor the results and the operation performance uh, so that's all important elements to be set up in the systems and tools perspective so given the short time uh, i could only bring in some highlights there's quite some details uh, that can be further shared uh, but uh, uh, um, uh, I hope to, to have given a flavor of uh, what, com what comes up, but there's one key message that I want to bring in uh, because I'm, I've now been speaking about the uh, circular supply chain and the setup of our reverse supply chain as we do it, but it needs to be done in full sync uh, with those two other pillars. Uh, we, if you are running a program, like a multiple year program, as in this example, uh, uh, then it is important that that uh, uh, circular business development, the uh, reverse supply chain and circular product design are go moving in sync and because only then uh, you get ready to deliver the circular value according to uh, your ambition. 
And that's, uh, I think, that is where we are back uh, to uh, our starting point and uh, where I would like to hand back to you. Yeah, well, um, thanks, Hans. I, I'm personally, I'm always, uh, yeah, it literally puts a smile on, on my face when I hear you speak. I've been now part of this sort of <laughs> circular economy uh, community for a while. And I think, you know, moving and bridging the strategy to execution gap is something that uh, is on top of mind for, for most of us who take uh, this topic serious and people like you make it happen. So uh, I am a little bit humbled in all honesty to be working with you and also some of the other co colleagues. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for this in-depth uh, review. Um, we promised that we would uh, address uh, some questions and that's I think the most important part because we are here to spread the impact beyond the four walls of Philips and, uh, and also help others accelerate their journey. Um, so I, I would actually like to ask just maybe from my end uh, a quick question first, and that's uh, what gets you most excited about this stuff? Uh, uh, maybe speaking from the heart a little bit more than from uh, from the mind. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very good point hey? um, because actually uh, um, um, I've been working in supply chain all my professional career and I was trained, really trained and have developed in linear supply chain. From the personal perspective, uh, you start working and thinking circular, mm -hmm. but now making that, bringing that, that, that point like, okay, hey, what can I do uh, for this sustainability and making that happen now in, in my job, uh, that is really giving so much energy. Uh, and that's indeed uh, uh, whereby you see that it is once, on one side, it gives energy, but also what you see is that what I found out coming from linear supply chain is that circular supply chain will be really a new element in our supply chains that uh, uh, that needs to that needs to be and will be addressed in the upcoming time uh, by companies, by universities, etc. Because there's a new element with new design elements, uh, uh, with new execution elements, uh, and we are at the beginning of that. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So uh, to keep things fair, I actually uh, tried to uh, devise my own strategy of answering all the, uh, the, the, the amazing questions that are coming in. Uh, I tried to answer some of them already in the chat. I also highly encourage you to fill out the contact form if you have any further questions when you review the webinar or when you still think of something afterwards uh, so that we can respond to you. Uh, but in, in all fairness, I would like to go with uh, one anonymous question uh, that came in first. Um, and, and this question is to you, Hans, and I'll try to maybe uh, help, help answer the question if there's uh, um, something I can add. But the question is, and it, that brings, builds a little bit on your point here, is would you suggest that reverse supply chains are an in, uh, invention of newly arising circular economy movements? Or is this, some, uh, is this uh, more a change in how we look at, prioritize, and optimize reverse uh, uh, chains, right? So how does that feel for you, maybe, personally, and at Philips? That's the question. Yeah, I think that's a good point, eh? because you see that reverse operations and activities are, are oftentimes already more or less in place. Eh? We do it. Uh, what I found that that, that is new is the, the scaling perspective. Because you can you see that very often, like limited flows, you can do that manual, etc. But really looking into the change that that circularity bring, will bring in is that basically, in theory, your reverse supply chain could become as big as your linear supply chain if you get 100% back. And that, I think, that is the, uh, the, the, the change that we have to do in our mindset. Uh, so it is not about can we take back in small volumes or small quantities ad hoc as we're used to, mm -hmm. but can we do that in a scaled way and also bringing back the value of the products uh, that we can also do that in a very efficient way uh, to make sure that the cost of our reverse operations uh, can comp at least compete eh, with our new buy alternative because otherwise eh, you come to the decision like okay hey shall we buy the cheaper new new part eh, or the recovered more expensive part yeah yeah thanks thanks hans that's uh, very uh, insightful um I, it reminds me a little bit of the idea that you know we've been building these linear supply chains for hundreds of years and now all of a sudden yeah people like you are asked to innovate 
and design this reverse supply chain or at least this scalable circular yeah. supply chain within just a couple of years which is a, a huge job i guess and also a huge transformation and i i mentioned transformation because i want to also highlight that the um the way we approach this within Philips, I always think it's almost a 50-50 split. So also to one of the other questions that I saw, I think it was by Christine, um, uh, the more important leave levers for creating buy-in. So the pilot approach, as well as you know the intensity and frequency of engagement with stakeholders through different methodologies, whether it's a, the roadmap that is referenced uh, uh, in the last slide, or whether it's your pilot, I think, you know, Half of this is a technical exercise and half of this, this is changing people's hearts and minds yeah. to, to come on board to this new reality. Yeah. And that's also what we can see from that experience. So in the program that we're conducting, it's a combination of, and that's also a continuation of pilots that we're doing, because pilots show the benefit mm -hmm. eh, in real life. Eh, that's also helping in the change story and in the convincing of, uh, of people. Eh, and in parallel, it's about the structural design program. And the combination is a strength. No, thank you. Well, let's move on to another question because we have just a couple minutes left, at least for the Q&A part that is live. So again, I'd like to encourage you to continue asking questions either via the chat or via the contact form, and we'll try to come back to you. Uh, I am not going to try to pronounce this name because it's very difficult for me, and I'm uh, a little bit embarrassed about that. But the next question, Hans, is: Is there uh, is the reverse supply chain very different for very types, of, various types of electronic products? Oh, I like this question uh, because there's also a discussion that we very often see, for instance, within Philips. Yeah. Uh, because you see that in Philips, for instance, you see large medical equipment and uh, this capital equipment, and then the other end of the spectrum is uh, the, the the consumer products like the toothbrush. Mm -hmm. And you see that the characteristics of these products. Also for the linear supply chain, by the way, uh, but the same applies for the reverse supply chain. Uh, so a solution that you have for large medical may not be applicable uh, for a consumer product, uh, and mm -hmm. you may need different solutions. And the challenge is like, okay, where do we have the synergies? Where can we use the synergies? Uh, and where do we need to, to bring in the differentiations? And that's, by the way, a similar challenge that, that we have, of course, in the linear supply chain and needs to be addressed. Also, for instance, an organization. No. Good uh, point. Thanks. Thanks, Hans. Uh, and, and just to make sure, so I, I realize that there's a, a, a lot of very good questions. I see a question here from Casper, uh, 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 whether there's ERP systems that are facilitating this. Uh, there's a very relevant question from Sandra on the, uh, I would say, environmental uh, impact of uh, reverse supply chains eh? and, and making sure that we calculate that and, and we, we apply that in our decision maker. Yeah, right, I'm mean, yeah. happy to follow up on that. And we have some methodologies for that, but won't be addressing it right now. Um, let me see uh, uh, if I find another question, which is likely to be our last question, or maybe second to last question that we can, uh, can answer. Or maybe just a follow up question um, from the previous uh, question that I asked uh, from the same person, because I think it's a uh, uh, you know, relevant in this context. Uh, but is there also a way uh, that we choose certain circular strategies based on uh, based on the supply chain uh, maturity, for instance, or based on the circular design that we do? Do you want to speak to that at all, or would you rather? It it is an interesting point eh, because uh, in the learning by doing, eh, we found out that it is very important to evaluate for which product are you doing it. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, and that's also you learn by doing uh, that some products, for instance, that you find out, OK, hey, we bring them to the pilot and then you find out that the design was not not ready for it or not suitable for it. Uh, so it is something that you have to take into account. And indeed, um, I think both from the business perspective, uh, there you see like, OK, is the business engaged uh, to work with you on circularity? Uh, that's their criteria. And for the products, it's like, are the products uh, that have been designed linear, uh, can they support you in your circular ambition? And that is good to have that in the evaluation to also bring success, and uh, because you also need success uh, in your change story. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and maybe just to, to add to that, we internally we have developed some from fra frameworks to uh, and, and, and trigger cards and those type of things to help facilitate uh, this decision-making process, right? Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, so I, I think just to be clear, so uh, formally we are already closing, but we uh, are happy to to stay on a little bit longer. So I'd also like you to to invite you to stay a little longer, and we will continue to uh, answer some of your questions. I think just a you know bit of a higher level question, but still something that at least uh, for the audience here uh, might be interesting for you to answer, uh, Hans. Uh, if you start to prioritize, uh, what from your perspective are the main challenges? Uh, and enablers for 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 the reverse uh, part of this. Yeah, uh, you see, uh, you mentioned the word transformation, uh, and I think transformation is is a key topic um, uh, because basically I think the technicalities and the content, of course, can all be uh, be solved. Uh, but you you see that let's say it circular, circularity, circular thinking uh, is also a change in your mindset. And to get that into large organizations, which are used and set up and organized for linear, and to make that such a, 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 a large ship, such a sea tanker, and to make that shift course, and that is a challenge. And that's also where you see that you need to have the leadership, you need to have the ambassadors, and then you can work further in the organization. But I think the transformation perspective is one of the biggest challenges. Yeah. Especially for a company, uh, uh, and there's many companies uh, that have been existing a long time already in linear business. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. Um, and, and and we have a, a broader transformation program at Philips, right? That helps us yeah. define our stories, engage our leaders, engage our employees, for our COEs and COPs, but also make sure that we embed the broader sustainability thinking beyond circular yeah. economy into our Philips systems, right? So Great. that's and, and as a, in, in terms of making it happen, you cannot do without. No. Uh, that's, uh, you need those bodies uh, that, and that is part of that foundation strategy uh, and leadership commitment, uh, which is then also driven uh, by bodies in the, in the company. Uh, that's, uh, that's really very important. Okay, well, well, when we still have time, let's go to the next one and try to cover some of these questions. Uh, Will is asking, how would you convince stakeholders if a circular uh, supply chain only offers benefits for environmental reasons, but have limited financial value to the business, uh, how would you justify the effort required to develop these systems? Uh, and maybe I'll start with maybe some yeah, more generic comments, yeah, and, and then point. you can help me uh, uh, create sort of the technical uh, uh, um, narrative there. I think one important piece here is that, um, firstly, um, Financially, my financials might not always be the primary driver to take action, right? So, future-proofing your business, um, uh, as well as, uh, well, yeah, future-proofing in terms of compliancy, uh, but also strategically taking a position as a leader in the environmental space is a, is a very important uh, piece within Philips. So, we have at Philips we have very strong buy-in from our CEO to drive our circular agenda, which really helps us. To, uh, to get things going. We have strong KPIs that help us drive the businesses in the right direction. Uh, but I think maybe most importantly, and um, this is, uh, you never should be talking about politics, but personally, I'm quite happy uh, with the uh, the speed as well as the, uh, the direction that uh, European regulation, but also some foreign regulators are, are driving this topic. So, uh, whenever we have do have a challenge, uh, I think the, the upcoming regulations, the uncertainty and the speed that they come to light is, is a very important driver for us to take action uh, on, on this topic. Um, and of course, um, I think towards, again, talking about the transformation journey, you see that this is not just something that that is related to creating business decisions, but people are also individually touched and are very motivated to do the right thing uh, when it comes to uh, yeah, preparing our organization for the future. Uh, Hans, yeah. from a technical perspective. And yeah, yeah, and because I uh, fully in uh, with that long term business perspective. Uh, so also that's again that leadership uh, uh, foundation that you need, but also from the supply chain perspective, because I think uh, this is uh, this can really be a topic whereby um, you can determine the success for the future. Mm -hmm. uh, because I mentioned in the beginning of my uh, uh, um, presentation uh, uh, about the supply chain disruptions, the supply chain shortages that we see, we cannot take them away. They will only get worse. And uh, so from that perspective, I think it is important that we onboard now. 
uh, and have that awareness also in leadership uh, that we have to secure our materials. That's one. Uh, but also, uh, and I noticed that also in the projects, it's always about bottom line business case. That's where we start. We are used to that. And that's where I think it was so powerful that, for instance, in projects that we brought in pilot cases uh, whereby you say, like, okay, hey, do we have a pilot case where there's a business need, a business urgency, where you have that actual shortage? Uh, because there you can start off with the small scale uh, and deliver value there, which is tangible. Uh, you can calculate and there's great benefit you can bring back to that business case. And that helps you to say like, okay, hey, we can could come to the can-do mentality and also envision the cost reductions that we can make when we would scale it. And so that it can really become a competitive point also in terms of cost and pricing. But the doing it, the pilots uh, are really essential to make that, to create that visibility. Else it is a theoretical execution and then you come in or yeah, everlasting discussion books, I would say. Yeah, yeah, and maybe just to shortly build on that, what I see personally is that when you drive these pilots, we see all kinds of business benefits that we didn't expect, right? So all kinds of value created or values supported uh, that we didn't expect when we started these pilots. So indeed, uh, starting a pilot with business value and then understanding the larger dynamics of such circular business cases helps to bring across uh, other types of projects which might have more environmental benefit than uh, uh, a financial benefit across the uh, across the line when it comes right. to decision making. Uh, sticking with the decision making um, um, challenge, um, and I think we should be closing off around three minutes from now, uh, just to also allow people to, uh, to have a short break before their next call or meeting. Um, but the next question is building on that uh, sort of leadership um, and decision making process. So in the in the start of the webinar, Hans, you, you mentioned six challenges for implementing reverse supply chains, one of which was the financial impact, right? Uh, and how so, so the question is, how do each how does each challenge weigh compared to each other? Um, is the financial impact the biggest driver? And, and maybe just before we go, I think it's it's good to put that into context again, right? So as I already replied to one of the earlier questions, so we are able to do this and we have built up a lot of engagement and energy around this in our businesses because we have been activating our businesses through circular economy and sustainability roadmaps, right? And even in the phase where you make strategic decisions, uh, strategic decisions are not being made purely financially. So when we make and when we make decisions and prioritize sustainability opportunities or we decide to move forward with one project over the other, we leverage our experience in innovation management and portfolio management uh, um, and so sort of make this weighing uh, and include more environmental indicators which are both uh, qualified as beneficial to the environment you know yep. bottom line and contributing to our targets yep. and the weighing we do in at the strategic level is quite equal actually so every uh, component of that portfolio management exercise yeah. is uh, weighed equally. So strategically, there we already make the conscious decision to have an equal weighing system. Of course, uh, depending on who you work with, you can adjust criteria and weighing, but there the strategic piece is weighed equally. And then in the more technical supply chain uh, challenges, I mm -hmm. think Hans, you can also speak to yeah. how, how that feels for you. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe also to, to add to that, uh, you have to also the weighing of the other elements, uh, but also even within the financials, uh, you see that our traditional business case setups are also linear approaches. Mm -hmm. And what we are doing is also for our uh, our pilots and, and also the business uh, uh, design is that we say like, okay, hey, let's look into uh, financial models uh, that will go really end to end, uh, which also incorporate uh, CO2 taxes, and also recycling, et cetera, end to end really. And that's important because linear perspective alone is not enough anymore. Um, and about the, the, the challenges, you mentioned like the financial, it is really, let's say, of, of course, a crucial and depending on the company, how the weighing of the financial will be. But I would like to highlight two other elements, that's the sustainability bullet, of course, and the quality and compliance. 
I had, that needs to be emphasized really because that is where you see that let's say there's quite some challenges there eh, because many of our products are still linear uh, uh, designed eh, and the success de is determined by okay how much can we really reuse eh? and quality and compliance and I think that goes for all industries and medical industry specific eh, is a key element there eh, to on one side make it happen but be fully compliant. Thank you. So before I go into the uh, the formal closure of this webinar, um, I um, I want to ask you, Hans, if you have any closing remarks, any last words from the heart. No, I hope I uh, could transfer some of my uh, engagement and uh, uh, enthusiasm of, of this uh, this topic. And yeah, whoever wants to know more about it or get in touch, uh, please do so. Thanks, Hans. Um, so before I do the administrative piece, I want to stress that um, from my perspective and our perspective at Philips, every job is a climate job, every job is a sustainability job, every job is a circular economy job. Hans is the living proof of that in my eyes. Until uh, two years ago, you were a linear, linear supply chain uh, expert. And today you are uh, telling us how a circular supply chain should look like. So I think this is also an encouragement to, for you to invest within your current job. What can you contribute? And those are my um, uh, um, final words when it comes to the content. Um, for now, I want to thank you for joining uh, the webinar uh, administratively. Uh, from tomorrow onwards, the slides and the recording of this webinar will be available via our website. Uh, the link to that uh, is uh, uh, shared several times in the chat. Uh, and if you, of course, have any further questions that you want to discuss or we can support you with, please do reach out to us. And we would, uh, yeah, we are really looking forward to, to, to expanding the impact beyond the four walls of Philips and making innovation work uh, together with you. Thank you for now and uh, looking forward to meeting you next in our next uh, session.